Hi everyone and welcome back to part two of our two-part video on stereotypes and regional language. In the first part of this video, we've already taken a look at some of the very stereotypical Australian views in society. In this next video, we're going to be looking at the typical Australian voice and use that to construct the sort of language that you might be seeing in the text that you're looking at. So remember in previous videos, we've already taken a look at what voice is. And we've noted that one of the real elements of voice is the idea of actions and language that's specific to certain places. So now let's take a look at that related to Australia specifically. So every region has its own way of speaking. Composers emphasize the way that a character speaks to reveal details. So things like accents and language are really a good way of expressing where a character specifically comes from. So from um, this sort of use of language, you can learn the nationality of a character, if they're rural or from a city, their level of education in society, their personality traits. And all of these you can see from patterns of speech. So it's really important that you're able to read those ideas of speech and be able to pick out some specific techniques to apply to your studies. So vernacular is a key example in Australian language and it's really something that makes up a key element of the Australian voice. So vernacular is language specific to a region. So if we look um, at a couple of Australian examples, you might have heard the phrase to chuck a yui. Now that doesn't make sense if you didn't sort of know the context, but in Australia it means to do a U-turn. Fair dinkum. If you say something's fair dinkum, that means it's really genuine and real. If you're knackered, that means you're exhausted or tired. These may be used as a technique when discussing language in experience through language. So remember these sort of um, uses of vernacular aren't necessarily easy to understand if you haven't heard them before. So the key thing that divides vernacular from just normal everyday language is the fact that people from a specific place understand it and people from outside that place might not necessarily get it unless someone told them about it. So moving on from vernacular, we get to the idea of idioms. Now, idioms are another common use of language that can be examples of vernacular. Phrases that have a meaning which has nothing to do with the words in the phrase um, is essentially what an idiom is. So similar to vernacular in that, you know, it's something that only a small group of people would understand, but you see that small distinction there. You can only understand them by hearing them before. So, you know, examples like to kick the bucket means to die. So, you know, if you hadn't heard that before, that would make very little sense. Um, a kangaroo loose in the top paddock. Now, that phrase basically means that someone is crazy or mentally unwell because it stems from the idea that, um, you know, a kangaroo might be loose in a farmer's paddock, which is up the top, be running around and causing havoc. And it's comparing the farmer's top paddock to your head. So you're a bit crazy and thoughts are whirling inside of you and who knows what's going on. So we see that examples of idioms there are things that you might not necessarily be able to work out unless you understand the history of how that phrase is developed. So now let's take a look at specific examples of this Australian language in literature. So Australian literature covers every topic, style and form imaginable. And over your studies in ESL, you're going to become very familiar with Australian literature because it makes up such an integral part of your study. Certain Australian classics created and spread this idea of the Australian national identity. And that, you know, does make up some of the images we were looking at before, but also the idea of, you know, the fair go, democracy, people battling in the bush, making their lives good through hard work. So some examples of these texts, My Brilliant Career, which is a novel by Miles Franklin, 
For example, that's a text which explores the life of a teenage girl who's living um, in the bush and dealing with um, the sort of limitations that that puts on her life. The Magic Pudding by Norman Lindsay, a children's story. Cuddlepot and Snuggle Pie by Mae Gibbs. We get to the idea of the ripping yarn. Now, the ripping yarn is a really important Australian genre that you need to understand in this idea of regional language in poetry. Now, it's the first Australian genre to exist. It tells tales of daring feats in a new unknown place. So this is where people were first coming to Australia and dealing with this new and unknown environment. This included stories of natural disasters, fights and exploration. Heroes, for example, would do things like fight against snakes, deal with droughts, tame wild horses, deal with convicts and have clashes with Aboriginal people. The next genre in poetry is the idea of bush poetry. Now bush poetry has been popular in Australia since the 1800s. It usually has a strong working class voice which focuses on vernacular and idioms. It also focuses on outdoor work, so it's mentioning things like droving of cattle, mining or being a travelling swagsman. It was made particularly famous by the poets um, Banjo Patterson and Henry Lawson. So let's take a look at a Banjo Patterson poem quickly. So the idea of, um, you know, the Australian voice can really be traced in these specific examples. So this poem is called um, A Bush Christening. So if we read this line here, On the outer Baku where the churches are few and men of religion are scanty, so outer Baku is referring to country living and it's really showing you from the very beginning in the first line that the setting of this poem is the Australian bush. So it's really going to cover a lot of those bush themes. Scanty is a colloquialism in Australia for the word few. Now there aren't many religious people in this bush town. So that's essentially what this um, couplet is saying through regional language. The steady rhythm is also forming, and that was a really key part of the Australian bush ballad. Um, we then get to the next couplet. On a road never crossed set by folk that are lost, one Michael McGee had a shanty. So crossed and sept um, use shortened versions of the words. So they're contracted words of crossed and except. Um, and this gives a really colloquial and informal tone. Folk is also slang for the people who lived in this area. And shanty is slang for a small house in the country that's, you know, a bit run down. So again, we're getting those layers of um, specific regional language colloquialisms being built on top of each other. We also see the importance of the rhyme of crossed and lost and scanty and shanty. This steady rhythm created by the rhyme, as I've said, is a very traditional ballad format in Australian poetry. Michael McGee, the character who's being mentioned, also reflects Australian stereotypes through his Anglo-Saxon name, reflecting um, the early migration. And in addition to that, it shows the M alliteration, which is a language technique that you could draw upon. Now let's have a look at stereotypes and regional language in prose, so moving on from poetry. Many Australian classics told of the development of the Australian spirit and attitude. So just like poetry, prose also did this. These books were authored during Australia's earliest years and focused on country life and the struggle of a new land. So if we take a look at this example, it is an extract from Seven Little Australians, which is a classic Australian novel written by Ethel Turner. Basically, the idea of this book is it's about seven children who live in the Australian bush with their father and their stepmother. And it's about the adventures they have with the Australian land. So this quote, their father, had you asked them, would all have replied with considerable pride, was a military man. 
So here we're getting the idea of the military man. So it's showing you that it's a story about a wealthy family who's living in the bush. This is representative of the new class of Australians that was born as wealthy families began to arrive in Australia and establish large properties in small towns away from the original city landing points. The um, use of had you asked is a strong exposition of the narrator's voice, which is telling the story. So we're getting that really good Australian characterization, the sense that you can really imagine the person telling the story. So the next bit of this quote, still, I think he was rather proud of Pip, and sometimes, if Nellie were prettily dressed, he would take her out with him in his dog cart. So Pip and Nellie are the names of two of the children in this story. So references to the children um, is really an extended metaphor for that young Australian spirit of the new country. The use of still, I think, is suggestive of the narrator's voice and uses first person to give a strong personal tone which suggests the perspective of this story. Dog cart is another piece of Australian slang, um, so we've already looked at some of those in poetry. But a dog cart is an old-fashioned horse-drawn vehicle, um, so here you get that sense of not only Australian language, but older traditional Australian language. So you see how really deconstructing um, all of this language through understanding the Australian background, it's a lot easier to understand what's going on. So that brings us to the end of this video on Australian stereotypes and regional language. In this video, we've not only looked at some of the key stereotypes that pervade the people and the society that makes up Australia, but we've also examined the way that this is expressed through language. And by developing an understanding of this, you'll find that it's going to be a lot easier to understand and analyse your text in this unit of study.